started this morning. I'm gonna I was gonna have some of these scriptures, but I didn't get to any time, so I'm gonna read it. Isaiah chapter one, verse ten says this Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instructions of our God and people of the Lord. What are your multiplied sacrifices? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your point feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. What he's basically saying here is our worship becomes tainted when we don't do it with the right attitude. When we do it with the wrong attitude and it becomes empty formalities, something that we do, not something that we worship and admire him to do, it just becomes empty. And then it says right here again, I'll read it, so when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. It's interesting how he would say your hands are covered with blood. Because what he's saying here is your, your sacrifices don't mean nothing to me. You might as well be full of you know bad stuff. You might as well have blood on your hands because you're not worshiping me the way that I want you to worship. So this morning as we enter into a time of worship, I want us to let everything go and just worship him with every fiber of our being. Amen. You can almost you can almost see the angels in heaven clapping hands and stomping their feet on some of these worship songs. Amen. I can't imagine one angel in heaven standing still when all fly away from God. <laughs> right? And I cannot imagine every time we hear the old brother cross, I can't imagine them not bowing down. Yeah. Sometimes we take worship songs for granted. Like the one a sister was trying to do this morning. We all know where that song comes from. It comes from a man who didn't, who lost the desire and the understanding of what worship was. So he was removed from worship by his pastor until he got it together. And out of that time came that song. So isn't that something how God uses times in our lives to bring us to places in our lives? I'm reminded of what uh, was spoken in Revelation chapter 22, and I'm just going to read one verse. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Don't expect to go back to the normal way of life. It ain't happening. Because Jesus is coming soon. There's no more normality. There's no more the way it used to be. It's from now on the way it's going to be before he comes back. Amen? Amen? I was out front. I was sharing with Tim this morning. I was out front and praying and walking around. and I see some kids on a little skateboard riding up and down the road. And my heart broke. <clears throat> The reason why my heart broke is because who knows if they ever heard about Jesus. And as I was walking out there, I thought, man, I want these kids' as parents are watching them. Because when I was a kid, there was no parent watching us. We did what we wanted to do. I look up the hill, and there's their two parents standing up there watching them roller skate or ride their scooter boards on the street. And I heard them both say, get on the other side of the road. You're going to get run over. And immediately the Spirit spoke to my heart. We all need to be on the right side of the road. Amen. 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 Otherwise the enemy will run us over every time. We sang several songs today about looking forward to going home and being with the Lord. Amen. We sang several songs 
today that should have put us in an atmosphere or an attitude of worship with every fiber of our being. I asked a question to the Lord not too long ago. Lord, I'm not going to say exactly what the question was, but the response was, it's coming. And what first has to happen is people have to get called into a situation in order for it to come. Does that make sense? Because the floodgates won't open unless there's a dam. And what do I mean by that? The floodgates aren't going to open unless there's something downstream to catch it in and keep it and keep it from floating and flooding everything. God's preparing someone in this community to address the issues of the kids we have in this community. I believe that. We can look around and see all kinds of kids that you know don't know Jesus. One way we're going to accomplish that, hopefully and prayerfully, is provide socks for those kids that don't have socks. As I looked down on their feet this morning, there was no socks, but they had them rubber shoes on. I can't imagine for a minute wearing rubber shoes with no socks. Not to mention the cold feet. So you'll notice in the back there's a box. And the box is for your socks that you're going to bring in that we're going to pass out to kids. And there's even some adults that will get some too. Okay? This morning I want to continue with our seven roles of the Holy Spirit. But first, I want to ask how many read the scripture last week? What did you get out of it? Did you see any parallel with what happened then to what's happening now? You remember the city of Tyre in your reading? Remember how far off they got? Because they were so interested in stuff. They were so interested in money. They were so interested in power. They were so interested in building bigger and better stuff. The moral of the story is this. God don't want bigger and better. He wants faithful and true. So if you take the parallel from what you read last week to where our nation is today, can you see the similarities? And can you ask yourself why God has decided, probably a long time ago, but there was a drop in the bucket, had decided that something needs to change. So he's allowed things to happen in our lives, in our country's lives, in the world's lives, to direct us down that path of change. Believe that? So if you're not ready for revival, get ready. Because it's coming. And it's here. It's going to come in a way that you're going to go, whoa, where'd that come from? It's been coming. It's like a wave at the beach. And my encouragement to you today is this. Everywhere you go, everybody you run in contact with, Everybody you see, post office, grocery store, gas station, it doesn't matter. Present yourself as being light. Because people in the world that walk in darkness need to see a light. And I'm going to say this, and I don't mean any disrespect, but if you look around us, this building right here, the only light in this community is what you bring in. The only light in this community is what comes forth from those that know the Lord. And if you ever drive one of these streets, like I know some of you have, been driven all over, you can just feel the darkness. Amen? Aren't you glad that God provided a way that we can walk in light and not darkness through the power and the resurrection and the life of Jesus Christ that dwells in you? Amen? Acts chapter 2. I know you've all read this, but we're going to break it down a little bit. Last week we mentioned, or a couple weeks ago, whenever it was, we mentioned about Peter's sermon about how on fire he was after the Pentecost experience. So Lord, before we read your word this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you enlighten us, that you open our hearts and open our minds to receive from you. Not our, not our human fleshly minds, but our spirit minds that your word says to renew them in the Lord. And that's what we want to do this morning, Lord. We want to renew our minds so our spirits 
get absorbed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because they were each one hearing them speak in his own language. And when they were amazed and marveled, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Perge, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues of the mighty deeds of God. And they continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. Can you imagine being in the middle of a move of the Holy Spirit and you have people saying, oh, you know what? Those guys are drunk. Drunk on the Spirit. Amen? Amen. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. I can imagine Peter, Peter standing there with a holy anger saying, you guys nailed him to the cross. You did. Then he goes on, verse 25 or 24. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I was always beholding the Lord in my presence. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover my flesh also will abide in hope, because thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life that will make me full of gladness with thy presence. Brethren, Peter said, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seek one of his descendants upon his throne, 
he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for my feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified, and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of one message. That message was delivered in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Everything you speak forth from the Word of God, everything you speak forth from your heart, comes with authority and power of the Holy Spirit. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. They were discipled, they were mentored. How many of you remember being discipled when you first came to Jesus? That's sad. Disciples. Disciple. When you first came to Jesus, were you disciples? Did somebody sit with you, explain to you, help you to understand what just happened to you, gave you an inclination to the word? There's no discipleship hardly in the church today. Some people think that once they come to Jesus, that's it. But we have responsibility to disciple people. These 3,000 souls that came to Jesus on that day were taken aside and they were instructed. They were revealed to them what just took place in their life. The Holy Spirit is our uniter. He unites us. He brings us to one accord, one mind, one goal, and has to see all people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. And that's what the Holy Spirit does when He unites us. We were talking this morning, and you can't be united if you're not present. And what do I mean by that? You cannot be united with the Holy Spirit, with like-minded believers, if you're not present with like-minded believers. There's too many excuses out there that keep people from gathering themselves together and be united and be discipled by one another. That's why I love seeing the fellowship that goes on in this building. Because the fellowship that happens here might sustain someone till the next time they come into fellowship. I was counseling with an individual one time and my explanation to him was, do you believe the Bible is true or not? Because he had all kinds of stuff. Is the Bible true or not? Well, it probably doesn't apply today. I said, really, what part don't apply today? Well, this part don't apply today. Why doesn't it apply today? Well, because I enjoy doing this. So it does apply, but you're turning back on it because you don't want to be a part of the truth. 
Every word in the word of God applies today. You can't take nothing out and you can't not add nothing to it. The Holy Spirit is our uniter. The book of Acts tells us after the first disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were continually devoted, devoting themselves to the apostles and learning how to be a follower. I have known several people in my life, in my Christian life, that have gave their heart to the Lord and then walked away because what they came to the Lord for didn't transpire in their lives and they walked away. I came to I came to the Lord to get my, my girlfriend back. Really? Wrong reason. Exactly. Oh, that didn't happen, so they didn't want no more part of it. We come to Jesus because we have stamped approval on the Lord. We come to Jesus because our sins have been washed away. We come to Jesus to be light in darkness. We come to Jesus to show people the way, just like Jesus showed us the way. If there was nobody out there that showed you the way, would you be here today? There's too many excuses that people hear and follow why they don't join in the fellowship and be united by the Holy Spirit with one mind and one accord. It's too easy to be led astray by their own thoughts, their own desires, their own pride, their own false humility. <coughs> the Holy Spirit is the uniter. They began to break bread in prayer. Verse 42, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. We sang a song this morning about prayer. The Bible says prayer without ceasing. The prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Does that mean when you pray or you're not walking in righteous, God's going to hear you? What it means is this. Are you striving for righteousness? Are you trying to achieve the righteousness that God has already made available to you? Remember, the Bible says, Oh, there is none righteous, no, not one. But there is no condemnation to anybody. Right? But we are righteous in God's eyes because of what Jesus has accomplished. It's up to us to walk in that righteousness. And that's how the Holy Spirit brings a unification to like-minded people. Have you ever shared the Lord with somebody or just been in the position of somebody where they had, um, you know, uh, I read, I do this, I, I know who this guy is, I know who Jesus is, I know who God is, but I don't want nothing to do with that. Yeah. All the time, huh? Yeah, all the time. The enemy has convinced them that you don't need that. Folks, we are in a war. We're in a battle. But what's so cool about it is we're already victorious. We already have the victory. Jesus already destroyed death and the grave. He already did it. The death and the grave couldn't keep Jesus down. And he can't keep you down. Amen? The Greek word used for this type of fellowship is koinonia. Which means to gather together, to be, to be, to, to, to uh, be with each other, to, to, to help each other, to walk in with each other, to, to understand what people are going through. It's a power that the Holy Spirit gives us to understand what people's needs are. The first time that word was used was just in the scripture. And then it's been the, the word used 18 other times throughout the New Testament. As a testimony to us that we need that koinonia fellowship. We need that koinonia spirit filled unity. Have you ever been in a situation? You know, I'll, I'll relate to you a, a story I had in Huntington Beach. A friend of mine were walking in the pier where they were doing all the surfing and stuff, and there was this gang of morons there, if you know what I mean. So my friend and I, we, you know, we weren't afraid of nothing at the time. We gonna walk right through this group and, you know, go to the, I don't know how many of you remember the, uh, if you've ever been in the beach down there, they have these, uh, chips. They're, they're like strips, I guess you call them, but they put this vinegar stuff on them. But anyway, we're going for some of that. Well, pretty soon, these guys thought they were gonna stop us from doing anything. So they surrounded us. And when they surrounded us, David and I, the first, our first, 
Our first thing we did was turn our back to each other. Yeah. And lean up against each other. Because when we did that, we knew, or we could see all the way around to the first yoko that wants to come to attack. We didn't flee. We didn't flee. Or one of them didn't go, oh man, because when you start doing that, the enemy goes, oh, I got you now. You stand back to back. You be with like-minded people. Let the Spirit give you the power to be an overcomer, no matter what the battle is. The Holy Spirit is a unifier. He unites us. Koinonia is also translated into partnership. We are partners in this, in this revelation of who Christ is in us and what our calling is to the world. It's time for God's people to... To, to get out of their little corner, to get out of their little shell. Because when revival comes, you're going to go, man, where'd that come from? Because you weren't in the middle of it. Each one of us has a responsibility to do during this time that we live in. Oh, someone else will do it. No, you're the one that's called to do it. Someone else might get called to the same type of thing, but not what you were called. It's a supernatural grace that causes Christians to love one another. How about that? It's a supernatural grace to cause believers to love people, to love themselves deeply, no matter who they used to be or what kind of presence they put out. It's Jesus in us and the, the, the supernatural power the Lord has of us to love those that we wouldn't have loved ten years ago. Or pre-Christian days, however long that was. But God says something in that. There's no way, and there were these two men went to a funeral this weekend. There's no way. When I was a, my stepfather was the international president of the Hessians Motorcycle Club, there was no way you'd walk in the middle of that group and start loving on people. No way. Because they'd bury you out behind the tent. Because that wasn't who they were. So when Cliff mentions this guy, he becomes saved, he gets to know the Lord, his, his, his demeanor changes. And I'll bet his biggest desire was to see bikers come to Christ. Amen. Is that true? Yeah. His biggest desire was to see bikers come to Christ. When an alcoholic gets, gets changed by the Spirit, their biggest desire is to see alcoholics get set free and come to Christ. Yeah. Drug addicts. Pornography, all that. When you've been set free, your biggest desire is to bring those people in. If you are so bound up by work and you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, your desire is to help people understand, you know what, you don't have to work so hard. There's nothing wrong with hard work, but when you pour your whole life into it and don't allow the Lord to bring you to a place of maturity, there's something wrong there. Amen? After the outpouring of the Spirit in Acts, Koinonia caused the early disciples to share their possessions unselfishly. How about that nowadays? Verse 44. And there, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now, I'm not saying going out and selling everything and become a commune and, and go, you know, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this. If your possessions become more important to you than helping those less, there's something wrong there. But when God supplies you with something and you say, Lord, thank you for the supply, but what do you want me to do with it? Seriously. You know, I've got these needs, God, but what do you want me to do with the gift that you've given me? I want you to do with so-and-so. Really? I was hoping you'd say, go buy a new car. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say, go do this. No, I gave you this to do this. Amen? Yeah. Are we always that way? And they shared meals often. Verse 46, and day by day, Continuing with one mind. One mind. There's that one mind again. Like-minded faith. Like-minded people. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, 
they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. They were glad to be together with each other. I don't know about you, but I've been in different different situations, not so much here, but I've been in different situations. I walk people walk in the door and they got this. When we're kids, come on, Dad, come on. You see how things have changed? Back in the day when you had, you know, these preachers from yesterday, their kids could not wait to get on the front row. And hear what the preacher had to say, or hear what the youth director had to say, or or, or to get involved in youth group. I'll tell you what, we you know what? We are we are missing out. We are missing out on the call of the church. We are missing out and we are failing in areas yes. miserably. But that does not mean that God's not done yet. God is, is setting up. God is setting us up for what he's about to do. Amen? I think I might have told you this, but you know where the, the, the greatest revival is taking place right now? China. China. The second greatest revival, if you can believe this, Afghanistan. You know why? Because people aren't afraid to share Jesus because there's no other hope left. That's right. We in America, we still have things to hope for. But when we hope in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that should automatically fill us with the desire to share the Lord with other people. So when someone comes to you and says, hey, would you be a part of this team? Yeah! The reason why you can say yeah is because you've been praying, Lord, how do you want me to be used? What is it that you want me to do? And when someone goes, hey, you've been, you were laid on my heart, how would you like to get involved? Oh, yeah! I've told Tim this morning, I've been praying for an individual that God would bring an individual to this body of believers that is so in love with kids that they'll hit every house, every school, every park with the with the with just an invite, just an invite. Because if they're not invited, they won't come. Especially if the parents got a sour grape bill. Amen. And those of you that live here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You see it more than I do. Oh, yeah. It is not possible before Pentecost to have this kind of manifestation of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because Jesus was ascended to the Father and the Spirit was ascended. So before the cross, there couldn't have been this kind of indwelling. Now, the Old Testament, the Spirit showed up here and there and did what he had to do. But as far as living in you, how, how cool would it have been to be a part of that team, to watch the Holy Spirit move on their 12 disciples, or 11, well, they took a vote, so there are 12 of them again. How, many, how awesome would it be to sit there and watch what God was doing with an infilling of the Holy Spirit and watch thousands coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because as you read on, 4,000 came the next time he spoke. Can you imagine? That's the whole community of Dobbins and Oregon House. Yeah. Right? The Holy Spirit also brings dunamis power, which enables us to heal the sick and to work miracles. Dunamis power is direct power from the Holy Spirit that gives you the ability. Jesus said, hey, you're going to go heal the sick. You're going to go raise the dead. That's what you're called to do. But you have to wait until the indwelling comes. So when, when we pray for people to get healed and to get well, and it doesn't happen right away, what happens to our faith? Oh, no. no. Lord, you're working. I, I know you're working. I pray the prayer of faith and you're going to work. You're going to do it. But what we have to realize is his time, not ours. Right. 
We've all in this room have seen God heal people in need. Right? We've had it here several times. We've had it here several times. David, um, what's your name again? <laughs> Cindy. Cindy. We've seen it several times. We've seen people with, get ankles healed. We've seen, we had one people come visit us. Her ankles healed before she even got to her car. We've seen that, but that doesn't mean it happens like that all the time. But it still means it happens. Amen. It still means it happens. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, the coin of the power caused the disciples to be unselfish. To give away stuff. Because they want to see people gathered in. Koinonia was essential ingredient. I'll call it, let's say koinonia is a fellowship spirit. Let's say that. Can we say that? A fellowship spirit. Even though it's, it, even though it's from the power, of, even though it's from the spirit to give you fellowship with those people and to, to reach out. Let's call it a fellowship spirit. They, they, it was essential in the New Testament time to have that fellowship spirit, to have that koinonia, to reach out to those. To reach out to those that were less favorable. Can you imagine today? Now, leprosy isn't a big deal as it was back then. But can you imagine walking up to a leper and throw your arm around him and tell him how much you loved him or her and, and prayed for him and laid your hands on him and then turn around and walk off? Not back then. <laughs> Now he's unclean. Or how about the woman with 13 years of issue of blood? Her biggest desire was to find the hem of Jesus' garment. When she touched that hem, she was set free. Paul, Timothy, Luke, Titus, Priscilla, and Aquila, as a team, brought forth this Koinonia Fellowship. They brought forth the power of the Spirit to, to, to be fellowship with everyone that was in that crowd that day and beyond. Can you imagine 3,000 people going back to their hometown and say, hey, guess what I heard? <laughs> Where'd you hear that from? From this guy named Peter. Well, let's go. And they, yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine people in this little church right here going to the, to the post office or to the store or wherever and say, guess what I heard today? What did you hear today? Jesus loves you. Amen. Really? Yeah. yeah. Who's Jesus? Let me tell you. It only takes a little bit, folks. Right? Jesus loves you. Oh, yeah, right. I yeah. Think, think you this, I think that. Let's sit down. Let me tell you the story. Yeah. Yeah. You're not alone, brother. You're not alone, sister. Before I came to know Jesus, I might as well just shot myself and buried myself in the grave. That's who I was before Christ. But now let me tell you who I am after Christ. That's how it opens up. It doesn't have to be a big discourse. It doesn't have to be a, a seven-night event to evangelism. It just has to be truth. If you knew me before, what changed you? Jesus changed you. He wasn't like me before. Oh, you wouldn't have gotten the same boat with me before, brother. Sister, whoever you're talking to. Right? Yeah. You can't you can't download or fake it, this fellowship koinonia. You can't fake it. You can't download it. It isn't something that you can fake. It isn't something that you can put on one second and take off the next. It's something that's ingrained in you. And the reason it becomes ingrained in you is because that's what Jesus did to you, in you, through you. We will all have to scrap artificial event driven programs if we want to have the real, the relational Christianity of the book of Acts. We're going to have to give up on the artificial stuff. We're going to have to give up on the event driven programs. We're going to have to give up on the, the normal way of doing church and get to the nitty gritty. That's what's going to have to happen. That's what happened in the book of Acts. You've heard many, many preachers say, we need to get back to the book of Acts. Yeah, let's do it then. It's simply this, sharing with each other, loving on each other, sharing the gospel with those that don't know the gospel. You're, you, you, you mark my words as I stand here today. There's going to be a time soon 
when people, as long as your light is showing, they're going to come to you and say, why are you so happy? You, you, you know, I know your life. You're, you're, you don't have anything to be happy about. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. Well, you just got taken for everything that you had. You lost. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. You lost everything. No, it doesn't matter. What do you mean it don't matter? Because he is alive. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father where he prays for me daily. And he says he will never leave me nor forsake me. He carries me in the branches of his right hand and he draws me close to his bosom and he's cast every sin I ever committed, will commit, or ever will commit it into the deepest parts of the ocean. And the Bible says he remembers them no more. Hallelujah. How awesome is that? That's awesome. And we will have to invite the Holy Spirit to do his work of connecting us with our brothers and sisters in Christ with his supernatural bond. Have you ever been someplace or went into a, a meeting or a community hall or whatever where, where, where you're supposed to be with other believers, other like-minded believers, but you can tell that they're different. You can tell there's okay, something's something's not right. You know what that is? That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit saying they don't know me like you know me. That doesn't give us a, 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 a that doesn't give us a turn around leave. That gives us an opportunity yes. to walk in the indwelling of the Spirit so others. Can you imagine someone coming to you and they say it all the time, folks, and if you haven't heard it by now, you will. Oh, that was for them. That's not for me. The Holy, when, the, when the last apostle died, Holy Spirit, didn't, he's not here anymore. Really? Oh, tongues was for them. It's not for now. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you've got to speak in tongues to get to heaven. What I'm saying is a powerful tool to pray. The Bible says your spirit don't know what to pray, but it does. Amen. What I'm saying is this. If you come to a place in your life where the enemy is trying to get you and trying to attack you, it's the Holy Spirit that brings up the boundaries and say, you're not listening to that. Yeah. I seen a picture the other day of this wicked looking demon. Man, there's this innocent looking woman sitting there. You know, one of the old, you know, pictures from like 1850 or whatever. And she's sitting there looking up to heaven and the devil is just speaking into you know what he was saying, but you can imagine telling you. Those of us that have an influence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes up and says, No, you can't hear that. That doesn't belong to you. And then it has a it has a way of pushing that away. Amen? Yeah. Now I'm not saying when you come to Jesus, the Holy Spirit moved in. Because if the Holy Spirit wouldn't have moved in, there'd be no conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit's the one that convicts. Amen. But what I'm saying is this, as you walk in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the devil can't have any control. He tries. He's launches things against you. For instance, what my daughter's going through right now. She's under full-blown attack. And she needs your prayers. She needs your prayers. The reason why she's under full-blown attack, well, there's several reasons I'll get into them. But one of them is because God has an anointing on her life that she has not yet fulfilled because of circumstances. And what do I mean by circumstances? Things happen to us, folks. Oh, yeah. Things happen to us. And we have to have the ability to say, you know what? Not today. But what happens is when things in the material world start falling apart, our first response is, oh man, especially when it affects your health. But the Holy Spirit has a way to say, don't listen, that doesn't belong to you. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces and darkness from places that you and I cannot see. The enemy's out to destroy us. The Holy Spirit is the, the unifier, the uniter that keeps us together. Have you, ever, have you ever asked someone to pray for you? Yeah. And have they asked you, what for? Have you ever stood there for a minute? Pray for me. What is it that you want me to do? And then you begin to pray. And 
you see it, the Holy Spirit has directed you to pray the very prayer the individual wants to pray. Happens all the time. It happens right here in this church. Whenever you're being led by the Spirit and you're walking in that power, that goodness of power, the Holy Spirit reveals things to you that you would never ever hear before. The Holy Spirit is the convictor, but the truth ain't spoken, he won't convict. He can't convict, because he only convicts on the truth. If you tell someone a lie, what's he going to do? He needs to convict you of a lie, right? So we need to start walking in the freedom that we have in the Spirit. And again, I'll tell you how much I appreciate the, the fellowship that goes on here, the unity that goes on here. And I know that anyone in this room can call anybody else in this room and get help that they need. Yeah. I know that. I know that. Sometimes we're too proud of that. So then the Holy Spirit is praying for you. This is what they're going through. Do you believe that happens? Has that ever happened to you? When you begin to pray, the Holy Spirit unites you with other prayers of other believers. Next thing you know, there's 15 or 20 of you praying, praying the same thing. And you don't even know it. But the answer always comes out the other end. Folks, we live in a time when prayer needs to be first and foremost in our life and the Word needs to, re to be revealed to us to change our minds. That's another reason why it's so important for you in here that haven't been here on Wednesday night yet to show up for Tim's classes because he's revealing to you by the Holy Spirit how important the Word is to bring you to a place of understanding whose Spirit is in you. Amen? Have you ever read the Word of God and something jumped out at you? Because Revelation just, yeah. oh, whoa! Yeah. That's what God does. But we have to be in tune to that. The Holy Spirit is a uniter. He's a unifier. And I challenge you to go back over Acts chapter 2 and read it all again and let it absorb in you. Amen? We don't want to continue on Ezekiel 20, 26 and 27. We don't want to continue on with that falsity of what we think people need to be like or nations need to be like. Well, we need to be like Jesus. We will ever be like Jesus? No. But we can sure as heck try. Amen. We can sure as heck try. When we hear that word, well done, then we are changed in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that someone receives something in this room. Because I know I have. I know I receive something every time I open your word. Every time I read a sentence, your spirit brings something to me. And I thank you for that. And I pray this morning, Lord God, as we separate from this place, that you will continue to go before us and be with us every step of the way. But more than anything, Father, I pray, Lord, that a light bulb goes on in our head and we begin to share even the smallest things with everyone we come in contact with, even our family. Sometimes our family are the hardest ones to share because they know us. In reality, they should be the easiest ones to share because you change us. So, Father, I pray right now for the power of the Holy Spirit to invade each and every one of us. That every word we read, we will hear your word. 